Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this session hosted by the ASU Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory on the future of water, clean, renewable, and abundant. My name is Dave White. I am the Deputy Director of the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation at Arizona State University within the Global Futures Laboratory. I'm joined today by two women water warriors, as our uh, friend and colleague Amanda Ellis has noted. Um, and I, would, I look forward to an engaging conversation um, with uh, Lauren roth uh founder of 3R Water Incorporated, and Christelle Cuzera, the founder and managing director of Water Access Rwanda. Um, I will give a few opening comments, uh, and then we'll hear from both of our panelists, and then we'll return for a lively discussion session, as well as question and answer. Uh, please feel free to include questions into the chat box, and we will address those at the end of the presentations. To begin, I would just like to acknowledge um, that the 22 Native American communities have inhabited the land where I sit today for centuries. And Arizona State University is located in the Salt River Valley on ancestral territories of indigenous peoples, including the Akamal O'odham, Pima, Pipash, Maricopa Indian communities, whose care and keeping of these lands allow us to be here today. And we acknowledge the sovereignty of these nations and seek to foster an environment of success and possibility for our Native American students and patrons. And I would like to recognize the indigenous and native communities around the world who are with us during these times. Again, our speakers today um, listed here are Lauren Rothmanu and Christelle Quizera, as, long as, my, as well as myself, Dave White, for moderating. So I'd like to start by noting that we're going to be discussing the Sustainable Development Goal number six for clean water and sanitation. And I'd like to present several of the critical global water challenges that motivate the need for innovation, entrepreneurship, and the development of solutions to improve outcomes. Freshwater management is one of the most pressing global challenges for sustainable development in the, area, in the era of the Anthropocene. Water is a fundamental human necessity and essential to improve social equity, promote broad economic development, and protect the functioning of the Earth system. Indeed, global freshwater use has been identified as one of the nine planetary boundaries regulating the safe operating space of the Earth system to support humanity. And freshwater is specifically addressed, of course, in SDG 6, which is to ensure access to water and sanitation for all. There are a number of pressing global water challenges that we must take urgent action to address in this, the decade of action. So as noted here in this infographic and data provided by the United Nations, despite our significant progress in the work of, of women like Lauren and Christelle, as well as many thousands around the world, we face the fact that billions throughout the world still lack access to safely managed water and sanitation and basic hand washing facilities at home. This of course has become particularly acute as we have responded to the COVID-19 global pandemic. Recent estimates suggest that in about one quarter of countries around the world, less than half of the household wastewater flows are treated safely. And this pandemic has simply exacerbated inequities and multiplied the impacts of climate change. Moving forward, of course, we are facing the impacts of a warming planet, as well as the impacts on the availability of freshwater. This graphic from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shows the percentage of mean annual stream flow for the glo global mean temperature of approximately two degrees Celsius above the historical average. And what you should note is looking around the world, there are a variety of areas that are of significant risk, including many areas on the African continent, across Europe, and across North America and South America. Um, these are elements of the climate crisis and need to be critically addressed in our immediate future. 
Water security, which is my focus, um, and we'll hear from Lauren and Christelle to talk about other aspects of our water challenges, including water quality and water sanitation and treatment of wastewater. Water security is something that we need to address at multiple scales, from individual levels to households to regional and global scales. And we need to do this to create beneficial outcomes and development goals that are respective of a variety of different cultural um, perspectives, values, and stakeholder points of view. Now, fortunately, we have been working for several decades to address these water challenges, including adapting to climate change. Um, and we'll hear from both of the, the presenters about strategies in terms of both technology as well as the development of social capacity and capital to address these stages in the climate adaptation cycle. We must move rapidly beyond assessment and planning into creating, implementing solutions, monitoring, evaluating, and adapting to those solutions. We need new and innovative approaches and investment to develop technology and capacity. Now this graphic, which you can um, find from our partners at Relix, uh, who help us to understand the impact of research and innovation on the sustainable development goals, the take home message from this graphic is that during the time period assessed here, which is 2015 to 2019, there were 46,000 publications produced related to, simp related to sustainable development goal number six, 46,000 papers produced. Um, that's 8% growth rate compounded annually in the number of scientific publications, but 58% of these publications were produced in high income countries and less than 1% of the publications were produced from low income countries. And only 2% of these publications represent partnerships between academics and corporate and private sector partners. So while we are producing a significant amount of new knowledge to address the SDGs, that new knowledge is largely not being produced by scholars and partners from low and middle income countries, as well as from partners in the corporate sector. Thus, we have knowledge, we have entrepreneurs but we must become more focused. We must become more committed to target that knowledge, to be more inclusive in the development of that knowledge and to create capacity and resources to invest and create solutions where the need is greatest. And that's why I'm so proud to partner with Christelle and Lauren on solutions that these two inspiring ecopreneurs, which is a word Lauren has introduced me to, um, uh, and I'd like to, to turn over uh, to Christelle to talk a little bit about her experiences with Water Access Rwanda. And I should say that uh, Christelle, in addition to being the, the founder and managing director of Water Access Rwanda, um, is also the 2019 We Empower Challenge winner uh, for the continent of Africa. And I can say now, Christelle, once the competition is over, that I happen to be one of the technical judges uh, for the We Empower competition. And I was happy to have uh, championed and advocated for um, your project uh, as, the, uh, as the winner for last year's competition. So congratulations, Christelle. Thank you for all that you, you do. And please share a little bit about your journey, what led you to be an entrepreneur and an innovator, and what you are doing to help uh, develop solutions for your home country of Rwanda across the African continent, as well as beyond and around the world. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for choosing me to win last year. Um, that was a pretty tough competition and such a great opportunity. Um, so when I was a child, I actually experienced some level of water scarcity. Uh, we had to go fetch water very far. far. Uh, sometimes when I was living with my grandma that we would go down a very steep hill to go find water and it was not always clean water. So I remember we had a river where we would get our other water and a small spring uh, that only had a small yield where we would get our drinking water. But still I remember it was always a concern for my mom who is a nurse uh, to always give us the warming pills uh, all the time. Um, so, but when I grew up and, you know, went on to college, 
I, you know, my family was doing better. We lived in an urban area. We had access to piped water. I actually thought everybody went through that transition with me. You know, you kind of sometimes assume uh, progress and development happens to everybody when you're not really looking. So I went to do on my, I went on to do my mechanical engineering degree uh, in Oklahoma in the U.S. And while there, one day I opened the news and I was reading that in my, um, in one of the districts in Rwanda, um, a crocodile had killed people. So people had went to look for water at the river, which was their only source of water. And um, um, Phil, you know, the crocodile had killed at, at least three people in that community. So I decided to do something about it. I received a lot of help. Uh, from my university network. At the time, we raised over $75,000, um, and it was supposed to be one summer project. Uh, so I designed the project, partnered with Rotary Foundation, with the Ministry of Infrastructure, um, came to Rwanda, bought the tools, the materials, trained young people to work with me, and we drilled uh, 13 boreholes uh, to help in uh, some communities that lived near lake infested um sorry crocodile infested lakes have cleaner waters away from the crocodiles but the balls we were implementing at the time were the typical ball you see in rural africa hand pumps uh, that are not very sustainable don't provide convenience uh, access to water uh, and we still require communities to walk long distances wait a long time spend a lot of money on repair but at the time i didn't know that i all the research showed me this is what a what a project in rural africa looks like so but uh, at the end of the summer um, as we drilled our last borehole the first one was already breaking so for me, it was a wake-up call. These were my people. It was my community. I couldn't just close my eyes and say, well, I did what I was supposed to do, and it didn't work out. Uh, so I didn't want my project to be one of those uh, failures because a bunch of WASH uh, projects fail. Uh, over 30% of WASH, WASH projects fail. So um, I, I decided to found a company and to solve this issue. So starting with 2016, we started implementing um, uh, better water systems using solar and electrical pumps that would deliver water nearer to the communities, not require them to walk so far and not require them to use a mechanical pump. Uh, and we will partner with farmers who need that water to irrigate so that they can distribute to the communities. And this slowly evolved into our water mini grid in 20, that we launched in 2017. Through a crowdfunding campaign, uh, we were able to raise fifty thousand uh, dollars that we used to establish the first two mini grids uh, that we did in Rwanda. Uh, now we have twenty-three mini grids. We're constructing five more by the end of this year, and um, beginning twenty eighteen, we started connecting people in their homes. So before we just had the public kiosks, now we're starting to connect people in their homes. Um, so that's one of the uh, biggest journeys for me realizing that access to water is not just access to safe water not just any access but providing convenient affordable and acceptable access to water for the communities we're working with something that brings dignity uh, creates jobs creates an economic transaction where the communities are paying for their water for the leader they're paying for maintenance it's convenient, it's a source of dignity and pride uh, for somebody to have their own water pipe inside their homes. Their children, the women, they no longer have to walk out to go find water. So we give the community not only water, but we give them time back um, and all kinds of other impacts, including reducing the time they spent near rivers, you know, washing, doing laundry. Most laundry in Africa still happens at the river bank. Uh, but now with clean water inside the house, they can do laundry anytime they want. Uh, they don't have to, con to think too much about the water they use. And on to that note, every, on average, Africans are using less than 10 liters uh, per person per day. When the WHO actually recommends 50 to 100 liters. So we've seen in some communities that we work in that people went from consuming on average three liters per day because they're so facing such water insecurity that they're um you know they watch every liter they spend and this is a source of stress 
uh, for many people. And that's something I hear a lot from our beneficiaries. Once they have a water point, they actually reach an, uh, an acceptable average. It's around 52 liters uh, per person per day, uh, which is still below. I mean, US is using 350 liters, which is exceeding uh, by a lot. So we don't want people to go on the other end. But when people reach that level of consumption, you hear it from their voice, from their experiences. Uh, a lady telling you that I don't worry that my floor gets dirty when I have visitors now because I can just clean it. <laughs> uh, but before a visitor entering with shoes in their house would mean a trip to the river, hours of walking, bringing back that water and then cleaning. So, but you see that stress just washing away. They have time for kids. Um, so it really creates a bar, it unlocks so much for, uh, for the beneficiaries. And so that really encouraged us to keep on innovating as a company. And I may talk later about the other innovations that we have done, but the, the mini grid has been one of the greatest blessings to implement in Rwanda and see how it's transforming so many. We now have over 65,000 people using our mini grids on a daily basis. Uh, and we will we'll keep on growing. We're going to add about 15,000 before the end of the year. Uh, but our ambition, of course, is much, much higher because the need is 456 million. So we're barely scratching the surface. Thank you, Christelle, um, for those comments. And um, just so many threads that I think we'll pick up on in the discussion um, in your story. Uh, you know, I'm interested to learn more about the community investment in your business, um, your ability to, to raise crowdfunding um, is, is really inspiring. Your, your story about you know, focusing on your community um, and, and developing solutions for your own community uh, shows that you had an added level of commitment um, to see the, the solutions through. Um, and also the ability to um, lessen the burden on women in, your, in the community to, that is typically is often um, uh, inequitably uh, uh, um, put on to women to engage in water fetching and, and other activities, you know, frees that time up for a variety of other activities, in, in, including, you know, work, family, education. Um, so lots of different elements that we can uh, continue um, to discuss. So uh, congratulations again on your accomplishments. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion with you um, as well as with our, uh, our participants. Um, with that, we're going to um, change gears a bit and we're going to uh, hand it over to Lauren, um, another uh, inspiring um, ecopreneur, um, someone who is going to share uh, a story as well as share um, some developments and innovations and new technologies uh, that, that she and her teams have created uh, to help address issues related with uh, urban water management, particularly with stormwater uh, management and, and harnessing the power of, of data and analytics to improve adaptation to uh, climate change, improve water quality and, and water resources management. So um, Lauren, I will uh, end my uh, screen share um, and allow you to take over the screen and then turn it over to you for your discussion. Okay, great. Well, aloha everyone. I'm actually um, here in Hawaii today um, and I want to as well as Amanda, I'm really honored to be part of this panel. And Christelle, what an amazing story. Um, it really is inspiring. And I think it's actually an interesting panel because we are, we are actually, we're kind of like this juxtaposed uh, two different people in two different parts of the world experiencing, you know, two different aspects of how water has been challenging um, in our own communities and individually and in societies. And but I also think of water as being that that thread that really makes um, that 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 mat that really unites everyone together. So, um, mahalo for your stories. Um, you know, before I dive into my uh, presentation, I just just a little background about myself too. Again, um, you know, I grew up in Carolina primarily, so certainly had the honor and privilege to have water coming out of the tap. Um, but, you know, I, at the age of 16, I, I had a pH meter and I tested my tap water and saw that the chlorine levels were higher in my tap than they were in a swimming pool. And that really alarmed me. That was my first 
um, dive into water management. And actually, probably my first ecopreneur job is I actually ended up selling water filters to my neighbors, um, trying to explain to them about the chlorine issue. Um, I, I didn't really think about it later, but I think my entire life I've been trying to go out and solve um, problems associated with water. I went to the University of Colorado at Boulder and literally got a degree in water resource management. Um, and it was there I actually learned, um, we learned about, of course, all the problems going on in the world. And then my final semester, I learned about sunflowers. And we were learning about this, these contaminated fields outside of um, Boulder and Rocky Flats that were contaminated with active uranium. And this one researcher was actually planting these um, fields with, with sunflowers. And through his research, he was able to show that these sunflowers had the ability to break down this highly re radioactive material into more of a benign state. And I just thought that was so amazing. And, and to be honest, it, it was really sort of what, I mean, no pun intended, planted my career um, in really trying to understand nature-based solutions and nature-based solutions also as it relates to water management. Um, and I had the honor and privilege to then go work with a man named John Todd, who invented something called the living machine right after college. And that was a nature-based uh, solution using wetland systems to basically treat wastewater and dirty water of all types. And then I got shipped to Hawaii to bring that technology to the state. And then later formed my own de ecological design firm and did a lot of integrated water resource management. I've been in this field for about 20 years now. And with that, I, I actually ended up um, coming up with software program that I'll be interest, introducing you today, which ended up being turned into its own up. Um, so we're really excited to share this today. And so I'll share my screen and give you guys a little bit of an overview about that and talk a little bit more about 3R Water and the Follow the Drop mobile app. Um, so... So, um, so 3R Water was, again, it was, we, we started this about two years ago, um, and really our mission is to basically go out and build water security and resiliency with technology, but it's really about not just um, supporting urban spaces, but also empowering individuals to understand their own um, play in, in, in on-site water management. Um, I gave you a little bit of background about myself. I ended up uh, working with a guy from, he's from New Zealand, uh, his name's Kingy Gilbert, um, and he's also been in the, in, in, in the software development space as well as marketing space for over 20 years. So he actually helped me create the first working prototype of the Follow the Drop mobile, app, mobile application, which I'll show in a second. Um, but before we dive in, and, and for me, when I really think about um, you know, water security, um, building you know, climate adaptive communities, um, I think it's important for us to also look to the past. I mean, this is an image of, of Houston, you know, 40 years ago, but really could be representative of many cities across the United States or even the globe. You know, in just the past 40 years, 70% of the wetlands and prairies have been removed from these cities. These are the ecological services of sponges. And so what we're seeing now in most major coastal cities around the globe, we're talking about 50% or greater of these hard surfaces. So this is things like roofs, driveways, parking lots. Um, so the impact of this is really the increased um, flooding conditions that we're seeing. Um, we're seeing more, more and more pollution getting into our waterways. And it also even impacts future supply because if we have all these hard surfaces, uh, we're not able to actually get that water back into the ground to support um, underlying groundwater resources, which again, can, in many communities is our drinking water supplies. Um, so just in the United States, you know, this is a six billion dollar a year issue with with flood damage and affecting over 21 million people. And so, you know, importantly, it's it's also important to think about the the areas where we thought things were once flood and where people flood insurance are actually dramatically changing because we've changed so much of the landscape and removed these ecological services. I mean, that, in that case of Houston, you had um, the bulk, when they had um, Hurricane Harvey, the bulk of the folks that, that actually got impacted were actually outside the flood zone areas. Um, and this is just because we ch were changing so much of the, um, the ec ecological services that otherwise would be managing that for us. And in, and in places like Africa, um, it's probably even more exorbitant just because of um, the lack of infrastructure as well. Uh, so this is also all the runoff then as water moves off the surfaces is carrying with it a bunch of pollution. Um, this is visually through plastics, but also can be through nutrients, which can also have um, impacts into our coastal waters. 
Um, you know, water, like I mentioned, is really connects with everything. Um, you know, unfortunately, like here in Hawaii, we now see that the coastal water quality is actually creating um, diseases in our sea turtles. Um, we also can see plastics now showing up in the food chain that are coming off um, from stormwater runoff. So it's, it's a much greater issue than just um, us being impacted in our, in our own um, urban communities. And so, you know, as Dave alluded to, like all of these issues are even becoming more compounded and more, um, you know, urgent as we, in, you know, move into this world of, of climate change. Um, so really to address this, and at least in the United States, um, cities in over 2,000 plus locations are beginning to create what are water utilities. And so in essence, what these stormwater utilities are doing, um, they create a, um, a fee based off of the amount of impervious cover someone might have on their property. So this includes both residential, commercial, state, and even federal um, properties. And so the whole point is by creating this fee by the, the amount of hard services, they then try to create these incentive programs for you to capture water on property and reduce your stormwater impact and, and, and flooding and pollution. And, and so not only the United States is also now growing in nine countries, I think the rate of growth of stormwater utilities is currently at about 5% each year. And so really it's being, they're being developed so that these cities can adapt um, to climate change and build resiliency, especially in coastal uh, cities. Um, so what they're trying to promote here is something called green infrastructure. And so green infrastructure really is, is, is a way of to mimic the natural processes of capturing stormwater, absorbing it and filtering it. So that can be through things like in this bottom left, this is a, a rain garden, for example, where stormwater is diverted into these natural systems where it can be um, retained for a certain amount of time and then filter and recharge the underlying water supply. Um, and then you have things like, of course, like rainwater harvesting that will hold the stormwater for a certain point. And then, of course, you can use this as an alternative water resource during drier periods. Um, but really what we're trying to solve here, too, is that these, a lot of these stormwater utilities, although they have these programs, or even, even if they're not utilities, they just might be city agencies, they, a, lot of, a lot of them are really lacking a lot of technological tools. Um, some of their biggest pain points are, are the ability to really engage their communities to, in, to implement these types of um, ways to capture stormwater and treat it. They also lack ways to, um, as an asset management, to know where these projects are located and what's their status and how much water they're capturing. Um, as well as in the United States, at least, they have to also do some reporting to the EPA this relating to water quality as their, um, you know, their pipe systems are discharging into um, streams and oceans, which, is, which are highly regulated. Um, so what we did with Fall the Drop was try to take these pain points and try to bring in this new, a new technological era. Because, I mean, I always think it's funny, we have, you know, cell phones and now, you know, soon driverless cars, but a lot of these, you know, stormwater utilities are literally operating on technologies that are 30 years old. Um, so with the mobile application, we, um, we license this to these city agencies, and then they can distribute it for free to their, um, the, their, uh, uh, their jurisdiction or, or customers if it's a utility. And then the app can allow the property owner to identify where and how much stormwater is being generated. And then it also then can provide them a solution through green infrastructure um, of, how to, of how to capture that. And, and then while we work with the cities, we then can then show um, what their potential fee credit or rebate might be should they implement these. Um, so just the way that it works, so if all the drops I mentioned, um, it's an enterprise software. We give a license to the stormwater utility or let's say even a city agency. They then can distribute then to their property owners. The property owners input the data. Um, the, the, the stormwater utilities can review the data and then use the app as a way to, to distribute the fee credit or rebate. Um, it also then allows the stormwater utility to track the locations and status of all these products, as well as the volumes of stormwater captured, and then they can use that for uh, any federal permit uh, reporting requirements. Um, so that's all I have here. Um, I guess if there's time later, I can show, do a little demo. I don't know, Dave, if you want to take a break and ask, get some questions going or... Yeah, I think, um, thanks, Lauren. I, I think we should just continue on, um, and, and we'd love to see a, a demo of the technology now since you're up and rolling and ready to go, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue on with uh, questions. Okay, that sounds good. So bear with me, everyone. This, you know, live, live demos can go multiple ways. Um, let me see if I can... 
All right, so as I mentioned, there's, there's two different ways to log into the app. So I'm gonna log in as a user. So this would be a property owner. Um, so when you log in, um, you first will get to this you know, map, which, which is basically your geolocation of, of where your device is located. So as you can see, I'm in Honolulu. Um, you'll be prompted then to, to capture an opportunity. So this is where if you are going to go outside your building, for example, and try to identify a drainage device where stormwater could be entering, I can either take a photo or I can pick a photo. Um, I'll just pick a photo since um, I'm not outside. But this is a picture, for example, of a, of a downspout. Um, and so it is in the next part of this, it'll, you'll have the opportunity to select an icon that's kind of best matches what you're seeing. Um, so in this case, it's an open downspout. And so we confirm the opportunity type. And then here, um, again, it, it tries to ping you where your location is. But let's say um, I was really located over here. I can just move my pin. My downspout is, is located at this building. And so then I can confirm my location. Um, next, we, we then look at classifying the surrounding area. And so this is important because depending on what type of green infrastructure solution you might want to put in, whether it's a rain garden or a catchment tank or something else. Um, for example, rain gardens you can't really put on a very steep slope. Um, so it just kind of helps you define what would, might be the best opportunity. So in this case, it's flat and say it's pavement. So we confirm the surrounding area. Um, now, next, you're going to be prompted to draw the drainage area. And by the way, in each of these um, interfaces, there's these little eyes that would give um, instructions of, you know, for example, what is a drainage area um, and, and, you know, what um, you're prompted to do. So in this case, I'm going to try to decide how much of my roof is going to my downspout. So you'd have to kind of both look at the roof as well as maybe walk around your building. But let's say um, it's just you just use your finger to kind of draw a polygon here of, you know, this is this much area going to um, out. So it self-calculates the area down at the bottom. So we can then confirm. And then with the geolocation, I can just turn on uh, the rainfall data. So in this particular location, I am getting uh, 30 inches of rain a year. So we can confirm annual rainfall or confirm yeah, the annual rainfall. And then this tan bar graph over here then shows the total annual volume of stormwater runoff going to that downspout. So in this case, it's you know approximately 65,000 gallons. As you can see um, kind of up here where it says the ideal value, um, that's giving you the ideal value size of your rainwater cistern or catchment tank. Um, if you wanted to do a rain garden, um, there's another option where it gives you the ideal value of 177 square feet. But let's just say I, I only have room for 100 square feet, I can put in whatever that is, and it'll show you that volume captured. Um, and the version we're gonna be doing, I, I guess I didn't mention, we're about to start a pilot with our own city and county of Honolulu, where we're gonna use this as an application process, as I'd mentioned in the PowerPoint. So here where you enter in the sizes, um, right underneath will be a pop-up that'll show you then your monthly fee reduction should you implement this size and type of project. And then when you confirm it, um, you'd be then submitting it uh, potentially to the city. So um, we'll just call this test. And okay. And so then I, I get back to these home screens. And you can see like there's some droplets that show um, you know, opportunities I've collected. I can also see all the, uh, as of my property owner, I could see, you know, all the um, projects I've personally, uh, you know, collected with the app. You can see them in list, list mode as well. Um, and importantly, you see that there, where it says draft or final, uh, the final can only be done when it's, it's reviewed and approved of um, by, by the administrator, in this case, the city. So I'll, I'll just give you a quick view of the, um, the city's view. So if you're, they would have an administrator license. Um, let's see if I can remember here. Okay, so when you're in administrator view, you can view all of the, um, all of the projects that have been collected by all the users. You can see it all in chart view as well. Um, you can rank them again. Uh, so this would be, as an administrator, you can have you know, your whole 
your whole customer base. So this could literally be, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of inputs. Um, they can then, you know, touch each of these bar graphs and see uh, what the total volume of stormwater was for this particular data data that was collected, what volume would be potentially capped. And this is kind of important because a lot of these um, utilities also offer grant programs. And so they can also then decide which maybe would have the most impact uh, based off of, of um, stormwater capture as well as cost. And then they, importantly, as I mentioned before, they can uh, review, let's say, someone's data that was inputted, confirm it. Um, and then when they get to the end, if everything was inputted correct, they can then change the status to finalize. Um, and actually, again, with this pilot, we'll have different status opportunities. So there'll be, instead of, for example, it's saying draft, it'll say submitted. Um, the, the city can then, you know, it'll become approved as a next status point. And then there'll be another status for installed and then later maintained so that they can up, make sure that these projects are being upkept um, in the community. So that's, that's basically all I have here. Um, certainly open to any questions. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic. And as, as uh, far as live software demos go, that was flawless. So uh, I know that's pretty amazing. So fantastic. Um, uh, unfortunately, I believe we've lost Christelle. Um, I think uh, she may have had an unstable internet connection. We're uh, speaking with her um, on the, offline, trying to get her uh, to reconnect to the session. Um, so in the meantime, um, we're going to go ahead and, and you know have some some conversation um, amongst uh, you and I, Lauren, as well as our our um, attendees. Uh, one thing I want to say about the the follow the drop application, it actually relates uh, to some work we have done. I lead a research center at Arizona State University uh, that's called the Decision Center for Desert City, um, and it is focused predominantly on uh, water sustainability and climate adaptation in uh, cities in the Colorado River Basin in the urban uh, areas of the Western United States. Uh, particularly, um, we have a strong emphasis on the Central Arizona Phoenix region, as you might imagine. Um, and one area of our research has been uh, doing some systems dynamics modeling to look at water resource management strategies and what interventions uh, may be plausible uh, to reduce um, um, and and in, and encourage conservation and reduce reliance, particularly on groundwater resources, uh, which uh, are um, non-sustainable in a in a normal human lifespan um, in our area. Uh, and one of the areas of analysis for our recent research um, was to examine the potential for stormwater capture uh, to offset. Um, demand in the residential sector, and specifically looking exactly at the kind of uh, um, uh, question you're answering, but also lacking exactly the kind of data uh, that 3R Water would would propose would would uh, allow, um, which is to look at you know how what's the surface area uh, on the um, municipal and industrial sector, how much water could be harvested. Uh, how much could that offset the demand in, in each of those sectors? And then uh, how much could that then limit our use of groundwater or other renewable supplies? So I think um, it shows uh, a, a, an important potential niche for this technology uh, in the meso space between looking at these micro areas and the more macro water resource management um, uh, domain. So I think uh, it's really exciting technology and, and really interesting innovations. Yeah, no, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, we see that we actually marry really nicely with the macro software. Um, so if folks on the, this uh, attending the session aren't aware, like a lot of times planners will look at like a water, for example, and see be some, you know, either flooding issues or um, other kinds of priorities like water recharge zones. Um, and then we can kind of come in and fine tune that on a, on a property scale um, about, you know, really kind of the granular scale that those modeling programs can't do. And then also, you know, it, it does give then that individual the power to understand like what is their individual impact of the, in this whole community as a whole. And so certainly one of the next challenges that we're, um, you know, we're hoping to solve through through this pilot is really trying to understand what what drives change then in the community. Because sometimes, you know, as you know, like knowledge um, is knowledge is, is power, but people don't always move forward with knowledge alone, right? So, you know, how can we include tools? 
that maybe show them um, how much volumes of, of stormwater they are capt you know, capturing collectively in these communities and they're taking part of something that's a, a greater whole and understanding their impact as, as an example. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it actually ties, um, even though the context is quite different, um, it ties directly to what Christelle was speaking about in terms of wanting to make an impact in her own community. Um, and being empowered by information and being empowered by knowledge about how your specific actions uh, contribute to, in this case, um, creating more natural infrastructure, uh, creating more nature-based solutions and enabling a more um, adapted community to, to face uh, climate change as well as another, a number of other risks and, and providing individuals and organizations with greater information to, to make those decisions. Um, I want to go to a couple of questions that are coming in from our, our audience. Um, first of all, uh, just a note from, from Jason Mingo, who uh, speaks to us coming from Melbourne, Australia, saying that there are technologies being trialed uh, there uh, for managing rainwater collection, um, uh, specifically one called Tank Talk. And so this may be um, a, a, a technology um, opportunity for you to, to share and learn from, from one another. So thanks, Jason, for uh, providing the link to that uh, information. We'll, we'll follow up on that. And then Amanda um, uh, asks us, says, Lauren, it's it's impressive uh, technology for possibly implementing uh, additional green infrastructure. Um, and she's curious if there could be opportunities for increasing the visibility for larger scale, uh, following on to our discussion just now, for more landscape scale natural infrastructure solutions uh, for water security. I mean, yeah, absolutely. This, although this particular program is designed for, you know, mostly on the property property level scale, um, certainly if you can be able to map all of these projects and understand that you're you're increasing the volume of um, of green infrastructure, you know, throughout your community, I think that would be a powerful um, tool. And I also think that um, again, kind of, you know. And in parallel with these macro tools to see, you know, where you're starting to get real changes, mm -hmm. you know, as if, if, for example, we know that we have a highly urbanized community, um, we start seeing that, you know, we get maybe 10 or 20 percent, uh, you know, retrofitting of green infrastructure, you know, we, be, we should then be able to see some measurable results. And this is also where we could, you know, partner with um, sensor mm -hmm. companies or other other types of um, you know, metrics and measuring uh, types of technologies to again, again, really be able to get the science behind, um, behind these solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. And I think um, from, uh, I am an environmental social scientist and, and from the social sciences perspective, uh, one of the things there's a lot of attention in, and um, research focused on the idea of, uh, of transformations and transitions. How do we um, not only adapt not only build resilient communities, but transform our, our communities and transform our landscapes um, to, as we've been saying, not to build back better in response to uh, disruptions like COVID-19 or disruptions like the climate crisis, but build forward better um, to actually take these opportunities, um, take these uh, uh, unfortunate circumstances and, and use them uh, to stimulate new innovations and transformations. And one of the lessons from the social science literature is that these transformations often are driven by smaller scale niche innovations uh, that disrupt existing pathways that provide uh, new inter you know, interruptions to um, dependencies that, that currently exist. Um, and so this is a perfect example of how uh, an innovation that may be at a small spatial scale, um, but has great potential to have a much larger um, uh, uh, impact on a, on a social and, and technological and an environmental system if it were to be scaled up. And I also would note that many public utilities, and I should say I, I chair the, the Water and Wastewater Advisory Council for the City of Phoenix, uh, advising our, our mayor and council on, on these issues. And I'll say that many public utilities as well as corporate partners um, look for pilot opportunities. They they want to uh, they want to see demonstration projects and they want to see an evidence base. And so this gives an opportunity to test out and provide an increasing level of evidence for uh, nature-based solutions and for technology enhancements to uh, stormwater management. So those both those are consistent, I think, with a overall strategy for transformation. 
Yeah, I, and, and I probably should mention too, because we, I, I mean, I mentioned our pilot with the city and county of Honolulu. So what you, what everyone just saw was, you know, our, the, the version 1.0 of the MVP we developed. Um, but with this pilot, we actually aim for it to be, be able to be replicated uh, really anywhere around the world. So one of the things that we're doing with this um, is first of all, seeing if we can bring together, it's kind of taking a one water approach. So in, in our case, we're working with both our board of water that manages our, our, our water, fresh water supply, as well as our storm water department. Our board of water is interested because they want, you know, increased water conservation practices. And of course, getting more water back into the ground, feeding um, underlying groundwater resources, a huge deal. So they have, a, they have a program where they have funding to support this kind of green infrastructure projects on individual level. So we're working out the first phase, which would be like an MOU agreement between the B Department of Water and the Stormwater Branch to basically one of them is able to give these credits and money back. Mm -hmm. And the next part of it is we actually then, um, when we do these pilots in these communities, we we try to local we try to partner with a local nonprofit that mm -hmm. um, has a good working relationship already with the city, and we select a, a selected region or whatever whatever a priority area is in these mm -hmm. cities. To first, then pilot the um, the app um, both in the with the residential community as well as with the commercial um, property owners um, to get feedback and engagement, and then um, customize then the product for that city. So we would then you know be able to bring in rainfall data for that area. We would then also be able to um, if we wanted to if that city did have a utility, we can link into their billing database mm -hmm. so that that right, customer's right. data. Um, could then output into money saved by implementing these projects. Mm -hmm. um, so we really see that as an opportunity to come in, hopefully de-risk it for these cities as well, but then also, you know, helping um, get the technology out there um, to the to the folks in their uh, jurisdictions. So I see how this particular I see how this particular technology that you've developed um, can. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Oh, yeah. Not sure where that's coming from. Um, perhaps if you mute while I ask the question, then you can respond. Um, I can see how this particular technology um, and, and product that you've developed with your company um, also uh, contributes to an overall shift in the, in the mindset and the practice around um, uh, water resources management, where uh, still in, in far too many communities, stormwater um, is seen as something to be, as you see, as you said, sort of swiftly moved out of the ur urban system. Um, and uh, there's a, a quite a significant shift in the planning and management community uh, to look at stormwater um, more as an integrated part of the of the water resource um, and determine how it can be uh, most successfully used for um, uh, in in the case of an area an arid desert city like Phoenix Arizona uh, how it can be more um, effectively used for groundwater recharge um, for um, uh, providing um, cooling through uh, watering uh, plants and, and plant material within the urban core. Um, and, and so there are many different uses for that, that stormwater. And I think uh, changing the mindset through these kinds of tools is as important um, as developing the tools themselves. And um, to that question uh, um, or comment, Jason, again, from, um, uh, I believe from Melbourne, has said, asked, uh, does the follow-up uh, to your um, uh, product aim to to provide any insights into the value added benefits associated with green infrastructure, such as those other amenities like urban cooling uh, that I mentioned or, or livability. So how does the um, the application help support those co benefits that that you might um, envision? Uh, no, that's a that's a great question, Jason. Um, you know, you know, as you as you probably are aware, green infrastructure has a whole multitude of benefits that it provides not just the recharge of stormwater or you know, flooding and pollution. Only right now, we um, we don't have anything that that notifies the user of, for example, um, you know, carbon sequestered or. Um, you know, maybe even, you know, supportive temperature, temperature stability. Um, but I think it's an interesting point. And again, how water does connect with so many other di different industries. There's certainly the water energy nexus, for example. Um, and certainly if you have certain gallons captured or gallons saved, and um, there could be some interesting, you know, outputs or, um, you know, how you're benefiting that, that piece of it. And certainly the livability 
um, is all very true when it comes to, you know, bringing back greenscape, um, green infrastructure into these urban spaces. It provides, you know, so much more than, than even just that was on the, you know, the forefront of it, which is capturing of stormwater. So certainly a great point. And, um, you know, and, and just back to sir, sir, talking about Dave, I mean, stormwater has been one of these, it's been the sector that's been left out of the discussion, I think, for a long time. Um, and I, I can't, you know, one of my colleagues, I mean, I, I, they, you know, use it as the, the redhead stepchild or something. I mean, you know, so um, I, I think that now it's just becoming so, we're just so much more aware of it. I mean, we are, are exist, I mean, at least in the, in the United States and also in countries where they have piped infrastructure, these things implemented during periods where we had a lot less people and a lot less intense storms. And so now we're just getting really, you know, hit in the face with, um, it, you know, climate change is, is one level of that, but just the um, increase of urbanization and population and um, reduction of our ecological services. Um, I think we're really just starting to kind of just get the crux of, of seeing um, how stormwater is, is, can be a resource when managed properly, um, but then also can be a huge liability when we, you know, are working on antiquated systems. So. I think that's a great point. And the, the slide that you showed that was quite stark in terms of the use land cover change uh, in Houston um, just in the last several decades, that uh, similar story has played out across many cities um, in the southwestern United States and, and across uh, the world where we have lost uh, that natural capital, that physical, that, that green infrastructure within the city um, and actually increased our risk and exposure um, while at the same time, um, the effects of the global climate change are having you know, regional and local impacts that in, in many cases, such as um, the United States, particularly the Southern United States that are, that are showing um, increased intensity in uh, rainfall, um, increased intensity um, in hurricanes and, and which improve, enhance the, the flood risk and that, that intersects then with these land use land cover changes, which just uh, motivate the, the need for greater and, and more um, effective action uh, to address those issues. I think another driver that's going to be interesting in the near term is also how potentially how the flood insurance um, companies might start getting involved as well as um, even just on the city level, you know, your, you know, your rating in terms of, you know, how resilient you are um, in terms of their own, you know, insurance. So Absolutely. I think these will become more more increasing drivers for um, you know stormwater really to become the, in the forefront, and um, hopefully that means then there'll be more incentives and more financial I guess on a financial way um, back mm -hmm. to individual properties because as you probably are aware, water has a very terrible return on investment ROI number because it's been so cheap so long, especially at least here in the in the, in the states and. So people to invest to make improvements has been really challenging unless it's uh, unless it comes in as a hammer. But I think if we can find creative financing um, by looking at this more holistic holistically, I think will be a huge benefit. And I think it's also the direction that um, a lot of these cities are going towards. Right. And as you mentioned, um, being able to identify uh, your individual scale contributions to community scale problems and the uh, opportunities that opens up for um, providing incentives. Uh, we've seen it in other areas of water conservation with uh, incentive programs for demand management uh, where, where residents are able to receive credits for a variety of strategies to re reduce their individual household level demand. Um, similarly, in the industrial and agricultural sector. So this is just a, a natural evolution of that collection of, of strategies um, that are necessary in an all of the above kind of approach uh, to address these challenges. Um, we're, we're just about at the top of the hour. I wanted to end on, on this question, Lauren, um, and that is um, what inspires you moving forward? And, and you mentioned one of your mentors um, and how that experience uh, shaped your career. Um, what advice and what um, comments do you have for if there are uh, members of the next generation watching uh, or who might see this later, you know, what what kind of inspiration can, can you give for um, everyone, but maybe particularly for women and girls to be able to, um, you know, become entrepreneurs, to address environmental challenges, to help ensure a future 
uh, where water is secure, affordable, safe, and available to everyone. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I always say that I think women have a little bit of a leg up in, in thinking about complexities and being able to, you know, see how different um, pieces of the puzzle all come together in systems thinking. I think we need, definitely need to be systems thinking, whether you're male or female moving forward. We need to understand that each of our actions certainly creates a reaction and is connected to not just, you um, you know, right in front of you, but really collectively on the, for this planet. And um, I certainly think the rest of this, this um, you know, decade and decades to come is really going to be about um, how do we come back into balance with the natural world? I mean, ecosystems, um, biodiversity, you know, all of those things are really what's keeping this planet, um, you know, habitable. And so we just need to understand that we're part, we're, we're not just, um, you know, here to, advance everything always through technology, but also being really mindful that the billions of years of experience of life on this planet mm -hmm. is actually very intelligent if we can just be smart enough to think about how we can replace this, these pieces back into this puzzle um, that we've disrupted. Um, and certainly having the, you know, the because we have technological tools, I, I certainly think that's going to be a huge game changer as well to get um, information out to everyone around, you know, not just in the, in the countries that have the most money, but how we can transfer these technologies in a equitable way um, to empower everybody to come up with solutions um, and share information. Great, thank you for those um, inspiring closing words. And um, on behalf of uh, Lauren and, and Christelle, um, I wanna say uh, thank you to the UN Global Compact for, for facilitating these uh, conversations. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory uh, for sponsoring this uh, session. And thank you to all of you who have attended um, and uh, uh, have a great morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Um, thanks, Lauren, and goodbye, everyone. All right, thank you, Dave.